And also, if you have a question, you can just unmute and ask, or you can put it in the chat. And I think Lisa, you said you would monitor the chat for me. I am also going to turn off my video to uh, make the make the screen share work better. So, share screen. This one. And all right. Here we go. Okay, so the Art Institute of Chicago is where we're going. And uh, one thing that uh, you can do if you're feeling a little stir crazy and wanting to get out uh, to see things on YouTube, there are a lot of videos that will take you to different cities. People strapped a camera on their heads and walked around. And this is one, I apologize for the commercial that we're going to see at the beginning. Let me move this. For just $67, you can make as many videos as you want, and you never need to pick up a camera or you... Okay. So, uh, here we are. It's like we're there, walking up to the pod of the museum. There's the wind blowing. Uh, now we're looking at Michigan Avenue, which passes right in front of us. This is looking down Adams. So if you were to walk straight down, it's run right into the train station. So if you were coming to visit the train, down Adams, there you are. You can look up more um, building, dental building. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Oops. <laughs> I just got told by my daughter that you couldn't hear me over the video. Uh, we could hear you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we will resume. So that's uh, now that we're there, we are inside the building. And if we were in person, why is this working? There we go. If we were in person, I would be hard pressed to go directly to what we were supposed to be talking about. So uh, we're going to do that too. Um, I'm going to just uh, start by visiting some of my favorite paintings that are in the museum. Uh, this first set I call Nighttime in the City. Uh, we have on the left, Nighthawks by Edward Hopper, very famous painting. And uh, you'll notice Hopper's uh, style, a lot of horizontal lines, muted colors. It's very quiet. We are removed from the scene. And in fact, you can't even get into that diner because the door is not visible. So uh, it's a real quiet setting. Um, over on the right is a painting by Archibald John Motley Jr., who was a Chicagoan, called Nightlife, painted about the same time as Hopper's. But in this one, you see the colors are so vibrant, the action of the lines, everybody's moving. You can almost hear this painting and you are in that room experiencing nightlife in Chicago. All right, I like to call this set Fantastic Hats. Uh, these two paintings were painted about the same time by two Impressionist painters. Uh, the one on the left is Two Sisters by Renoir. And it's just delightful to see in person. This hardly does it justice. The colors just glow. Their skin is just uh, radiant. And uh, it's just a lovely picture with fantastic hats. Over on the right is the millinery shop uh, by Degas. And what I want to show you on this one is uh, what I really like about it is how circular it is. You've got the round hats and her round skirt and her round face and the whole thing is like this circular composition. And this just really um, kind of dances around and around. And, you know, they must've just had wonderful hats on all the time back then. Okay. Um, I call this set um, Bright Seasons. 
The painting on the left is called Love of Winter by George Wesley Bellows. And uh, in person, this painting, I just love it. Um, you know those days when it's snowed and the sun is so bright and you're just sort of blinded by the snow. That's what it's like to stand in front of this painting. The white of the foreground is just blinding and it's just paint, but it really uh, gives you that sensation of being out and they're out there having fun in the snow, but you know, kind of wishing you had your sunglasses on just to look at this painting. On the right is um, a detail of the America Windows by Calder. And it's a long um, installation in the museum and it covers a, like a whole wall and it's uh, glass, it's stained glass. And uh, it was installed in 1977. I was nine years old and I suspect that my mom took us down there to see it because that color blue is my favorite color blue. And I think it must have imprinted itself on my brain. Um, it's just lovely to stand in front of these windows and, um, and just feel the, the blue light coming through them. All right, I'm sure you recognize the picture on the left, American Gothic by Grant Wood. It's one of the most famous paintings at the Art Institute. And um, my daughter actually was just learning about this painting in history class the other day. Um, just wanna point out the uh, repeated themes here of this pitchfork. So you'll uh, see that shape repeated here in the man's face with his jaw and line down from his nose in his overalls and shirt. You see that repeated again, and even up here in the windows. And, and I guess we could argue it's in her face too, but uh, this is that kind of repeated shape. On um, this one is on the right is Paris Street Rainy Day by Gustave Caillebotte, who's one of my favorite painters. And, uh, Oh, I forgot to tell you the theme of these two. I call this one uh, stern couples with pointy sticks. He's got his. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> um, so their pointy stick is their umbrella. And there's some repeated shapes here too. This triangle of building here is repeated here in the umbrellas. And uh, one thing I noticed when I was looking at this painting recently was these guys aren't looking where they're going but they're coming right at us. And they're about to have an umbrella collision with this person. But once they resolve that, we're next. We're standing right here. And I'm, I hope we have an umbrella. And we're gonna have to decide, is it us jumping off the sidewalk or is it them? And we will never know. Okay, this is hands down my favorite painting at the Art Institute, A Sunday on La Grande Jade by George Seurat. And um, this is a very big painting. You may have seen it in the movie, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Um, it's, it's huge. And uh, Seurat was a post-impressionist and what he did was paint in the pointillism style. So that is, I think I have a detail here. Yeah. So um, instead of painting like her skirt blue, he's painted it with blue and red and purple and all these different colors and your eye blends all those dots together to make the colors that you see. So from afar, this is gonna just look like a sort of a peachy yellow and this is gonna look sort of like a orangey red. And this is probably, um, I don't know if this details from this actual painting or not, but um, the border is all around solid dots like this. And your eye does all the work of combining that. And um, every time I go to the museum, I visit this painting. And there you can see the scale that we're talking about with um, this uh, painting by Seurat. Okay, so now that I've taken you to my favorite things, we're going to start with our theme for tonight. But actually, before we even get to the theme, I thought we better do Holy Week the events leading up to the first station. So we will start with Christ's entry into Jerusalem. So I, I actually came up with the idea to do Holy Week because I found this sculpture that's on the left. It's uh, Christ Entering Jerusalem by Richard Scheib. It's a bronze sculpture. 
And he's a German sculptor, but uh, the way Jesus's head looks, I thought for sure he was going to be Native American or Asian. It's such an unusual face. And uh, when I found this sculpture, I thought, well, you know what, let's do Holy Week because that's interesting. So um, that's that one. On the right is entry into Jerusalem by a Japanese artist. It's a print. And the artist's name is Sadao Watanabe. And he has a really interesting story. Um, his father died when he was 10 years old and he dropped out of school and became an apprentice at a dyer's shop, a place where they dyed fabric. And a Christian woman in his neighborhood invited him to attend church with her. And then at the age of 17, he received baptism. Um, so I learned then that his artwork is exclusively biblical subjects, but in a Japanese context, which we'll see a lot later, uh, artists tend to take these stories and set them in the places that they live. So uh, you can see Jesus on the donkey coming into town here, and it's uh, really charming. And he has a whole series of um, biblical stories in the same sort of style. Okay, so. The next one is The Last Supper. Now there are a million paintings of The Last Supper. We're very familiar with da Vinci's, but um, I had so I had lots to choose from. So I chose two that I uh, thought were most interesting. Uh, this one on the left is uh, French from 1490. It's an altarpiece panel. So generally an altarpiece with a uh, would be behind the altar and would have a large center section either depicting Jesus or um, some saints and, or Mary and then around the sides of it would be smaller panels with the life of Jesus or um, other um, stories of the saints and the sort of you could think of it as a uh, illustrated book for people to read the stories, kind of like the way we are doing right now, learning the stories through pictures. So I'll just call your attention to um, what this artist has included in this little panel. Out this window is a little town, uh, probably depicting the French town where he lived. And then through this door, and it's a little hard to see if your screen is small, but um, that's the story of Jesus washing the feet of the apostles. And you'll see this a lot. They'll cram a lot of information into a small place. So this part of the story happens before the, this part. And there's just so much detail here. Every one of the apostles is wearing something different. They all have different heads. Uh, it's just got um, lots of charming uh, expressions on everybody's face. And one thing I like to do whenever I find a Last Supper painting is play who's who, where is, and where's Judas. So it's probably, if we could figure out who some of these people are. I know for sure the one falling asleep here is John, because it says in the Bible story that John fell asleep. This is probably Peter, as he's pointing to himself, uh, saying, is it me? And uh, now it's your turn to guess which one is Judas? Anybody want to take a guess? I'll take a guess. Go ahead, Lisa. I think the way the chair is, it's the only chair that we can see with the back and it's kind of cruciform. The guy with the blue directly across from Christ. Yes, him. Yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking it could be him because it's, he's sitting there on a, the only chair that has a back and it's kind of like a cross. And I also like even the dogs eat the scraps from the master's table sitting down here below. I yep, there's a dog. little dog down there. Well, let's see if you're right, Lisa. Oh, sorry. Yes, no. I thought... <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Oh, money purse, money purse. Yes, he's got his money purse. It's always a giveaway. So usually Judas is looking different and he is the only one who's up from his chair. He's, um, and actually if I go back, uh, let me see if I can go, I don't know if I can go back. Um, and Jesus was kind of pointing at him, so, but then he'll almost always have a little money purse. So next time you see a Last Supper, now you'll know how to spot Judas. Now in this one, I couldn't find Judas. 
Um, this is from, this is a print from a book. Um, it says it's by an unknown Bavarian artist, so it's German. And this, uh, just this small panel manages to fit in both the washing of the feet story and the Last Supper. And it's confusing at first. I was like, okay, who are these guys? So it turns out it's two stories in one page. And um, I've got a little detail here. I think this is John, because maybe that's a fallen asleep person, or maybe Jesus has Judas in a headlock. Not entirely sure what's going on there. It's very odd. But uh, what was so funny about this is this is the bread. And you'll see what that is. Nice big soft pretzel. And uh, this is another example of artists using local details because they're talking to the people in their country. So this Bavarian artist put in Bavarian pretzel bread. And I've never seen that before. It was so funny. <clears throat> okay, it's a little easier to spot Judas in this one. This is the betrayal of Christ. It's an alabaster sculpture um, <clears throat> from France, oh no, sorry, from England. And uh, it has some traces of gold up here, little bits of red. So it probably was painted at some point. And it shows, <clears throat> sorry, um, little Judas, little pucker up there going in for the kiss. And this detail here that I really like, Jesus's hand coming to stop the sword, even though it's already cut off this poor man's ear. And the flecks of red here probably were to indicate that his ear had been cut off. But I think uh, just like this little detail here of, of this hand, knowing, knowing what's going on and stopping that sword. Okay, so now we will move on to the stations. <clears throat> the first station, Jesus is condemned to death. So um, the painting on the left is called The Three Judges by Georges Rouault. He's a French artist, Catholic, and I chose this one before I read the story about it. I thought that it was a depiction of uh, Pontius Pilate, Herod, and Caiaphas, who were the three judges who condemned Jesus. Um, but it turns out that he just uh, painted a lot of pictures of judges and it was one of his recurring themes. So this isn't necessarily those three men, but what I liked about it for um, our purposes tonight is this conspiratorial feel of these three men. Um, apparently Pilate and Herod and Caiaphas did not get along. They didn't really like each other, but they had a common enemy in Jesus. So they worked together. Uh, and I think this kind of dark um, background and this tight grouping just uh, conveys that, that um, kind of conspiratorial feel. On the right is Christ and Pilate by the German artist Max Beckmann. And uh, he was working in Germany as Hitler came into power. And one of the things Hitler did at the beginning of his um, Rain, <laughs> what word to use, was uh, scoop up all the modern art that he hated and make this big art exhibit called Degenerate Art. And Max Beckman was one of the artists featured in the Degenerate Art exhibit. And so uh, Beckman self exiled to Amsterdam once the Nazis were coming into power. And he drew this near the end of his 10 years in exile in Amsterdam before finally coming to the United States. And uh, one, what I wanna point out in this artwork is the two different ways he's depicted these two men. So Jesus has um, got the thorny crown and, and he's sort of drawn Jesus in these long pointy verticals and just looks haggard and drawn out. Whereas Pilate is all curves, kind of a solid, curvy man, completely different from, from this style. And I just really like this detail here of Pilate's hand. One thing I tell my daughter is that when you look at an artwork, almost everything there was put there on purpose. The artist has a reason 
for each detail that you see in an artwork. So he could have left this hand out and just had these two heads next to each other. But this alludes to what we know happens after this scene is Pilate washing his hands. So you have this to remind you about what he's going to do after he's done talking to Jesus. The second station, Jesus carries his cross. So I chose this one um, just to have a little variety. This is a leaf from a book. Uh, it's called a picture cycle and it has four stories shown on it. So Christ carrying the cross, the crucifixion, descent from the cross and the entombment. And again, this is uh, sort of like what we're doing tonight, telling the story through pictures. So this was a page in a book that uh, uh, the owner, the original owner would have used for personal devotion at home, sort of like the Magnificat, if you have one of those. Um, the story uh, has Roman numerals next to each picture. So this is 22, 23, 24 and 25. And then above each picture there and below here in French tells what um, each scene is about. You'll have to trust me that it's in French because that's what it said. And this is from France and it's really hard to read that on this picture. Um, and it said, uh, the notes about it said that the book 200 years ago was disassembled. So the existed and then it got broken up and spread around. So Art Institute of Chicago has two of the pages from this book, uh, this one, and then one that's two pages away from this one. So they don't have the one in the middle. And this is just a little detail. So it's kind of pixely, but you can see um, kind of cartoon style, just enough information that you can tell who's there. You've got Jesus with this cross, you've got the women, and then a, a little assortment of, of uh, people in the crowd. The third station, Jesus falls for the first time. So uh, this picture is a painting from Germany. Uh, it says the master of the Freising visitation. When they don't know the name of the artist, uh, they name it after like the town that the painting was in or part of the larger work that it was part of, or even um, like a, a person who was known to be working in the town at the time. Uh, so what I like to point out when we come across these uh, pieces is what the artist did to be able to communicate to his own community, the people who would have been looking at this painting. Uh, you've got local details. So down here, you've got some flowers and they're probably local to um, wherever this painting was located. You've got some scenery, although that's kind of, kind of average hills back there. Sometimes that would be more specific, like an actual village. And then um, you're gonna look for your usual cast of characters. So you've got Mary, and sometimes there are a few other women around. You've got taunters, this guy sticking his tongue out. You've got an assortment of soldiers and other town folk who usually are wearing some really fantastic hats. Uh, the soldiers have these very, uh, I don't know, German sort of looking metal hats, you've got some people with, um, I don't know, kind of turbans, different hats. And the and people looking at this would know exactly who those people are supposed to be. Like they would say, oh, that looks like, you know, the magistrate, that's his kind of hat. And then you've got uh, Jesus here. And you'll also usually see someone helping carry it. And we'll get to that station in a little bit, but that's um, very likely to be your Simon character. And there's always, almost always a soldier type up front. Okay. The fourth station, Jesus meets his mother. And I know, uh, I think in the student led one, it's Jesus meets his sorrowful mother. So these are two uh, paintings from the Netherlands about the same time around 1500. Uh, the one on the left, Morning Virgin, is by, I don't know how, to, how they pronounce Jean or Jean, I'm not sure, Hey, last name, um, is part of a larger painting, but it's been cut up into smaller pieces. So um, 
I think the Art Institute has a couple pieces of it, but not the central part, which was Jesus um, on the cross or maybe carrying the cross. Anyway, you can see um, Mary, she's looking pensive and uh, there's a tear there on her cheek. And uh, if you contrast that with the one on the right by Derek Boots, she looks a lot sadder and there's much more, um, I'm gonna see if I got the detail, yeah. Her eyes are red and swollen and the tears. So uh, this is a very popular image. And in fact, um, this one over here by Boots, uh, the artist began making them more emotional. So this is how it would have been, maybe this was in a church, so, um, you know, bigger and maybe not as, as expressive. But this one is a smaller painting and they started making them, uh, I think it's about 14 by, what does it say, 14 by 11. So you could take this home. And so they started making them so people could buy them for themselves at home and a lot more expressive. Okay, this is not Jesus and his sorrowful mother, but it is Jesus and his mother. So up till this point, you may have noticed that we have been largely in Northern Europe. And I tried to find some items that were from other places. We had the piece by the Japanese artist, but uh, largely the theme of the Stations of the Cross is going to be um, Northern European and um, it was difficult. I don't know if there might be stuff in other museums, but at the Art Institute, they didn't have much other than that, except they have some really fantastic Ethiopian art. This is a book uh, called um, The Stories of the Miracles of Mary. And uh, they, the style with the bold outlines and the bright, vibrant colors is throughout the book. And uh, this would have also been a, a devotional to have it at home. And you would turn the pages and, and have the story of Mary throughout. So I just wanted to share that so we were could duck out of Northern Europe for a minute. Okay, the fifth station, Simon of Cyrene helps carry the cross. So once again, we have a German uh, depiction of Christ with the cross. Um, and we can go through and do our little survey. So this is a much smaller piece. This is a panel that was probably part of a larger altarpiece. And this um, panel was job was to do the fifth station. So um, you can look, the background is kind of gold. So not a lot of detail there, but we've got our group of women over here, probably Mary in the darker. We've got taunters, this guy sticking his tongue out at the women and this guy doing a full on pulling his lips apart, sticking his tongue out at Jesus. We've got men in fantastic hats back here. And this guy is carrying the ladder. So I, I wonder if that isn't sort of like, that's a specific job that that hat would have told somebody. You've got the soldier up front with probably the best um, soldier outfit ever with these stripy pants. And uh, this guy, with his clubs. So all of this is swirling around and around Jesus. And then just quietly over here in the corner is Simon. And I really like that about this particular painting. They, they all kind of show that, but this one in particular, I thought just this chaos and um, noise are going on over here. And Simon's just quietly helping. And as I was preparing this, I. I was kind of thinking about how that's like today. We have so much noise in our lives and there's, you know, the news is just squawking at us about what's going bad and bad. And then just this quiet little piece in the corner where Simon's just helping. And I just really like this panel for that little detail there. Okay, the sixth station Veronica wipes the face of Jesus. So um, I learned a new word doing this page. Uh, the sudarium is the title of this. This is by the same guy who had the pretzel bread at the Last Supper. 
So uh, it's got two little angels up here in the corner and they're holding this, the big cloth with the image of Jesus's face on it. But I didn't know the word sudarium. So I had to look that up. And in fact, it turns out a sudarium is a sweat cloth that was used for wiping the face clean of sweat. So that is what Veronica would have been using is a sudarium to wipe Jesus's face. And uh, so in this one, you actually see the little angels holding up the cloth. On the right is a print um, head of Christ crowned with thorns. And the artist is Hans Sebald Beham. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right. But uh, down here in the bottom, you see this AD. So when you see that on a print, it usually means Albrecht Durer, who is one of the most famous German printmakers, uh, artists who did prints. Um, uh, and that's how he signed his name. So I wondered why was that on something that was by Beham? So what this artist did was look at Durer's print and then copy what he drew um, onto his own print. But this is on a sheet of paper, it's 18 by 12. And what that um, was again, like the sorrowful mother from earlier, it was a size that people could buy and take to their homes. So it wasn't, in a book that only some people could have. It wasn't a painting in the church. It was something small that you could have in your personal devotion at home. And I even read, which I find very hard to imagine, that there was wallpaper with this image on it. And I, I can't quite wrap my mind around what that room looked like with the image of Christ's face like all over the wall. Okay, the seventh station, Jesus falls the second time. This is a, another print from uh, the Netherlands. And this one is showing Veronica from the previous station. You see she's holding her sudarium and approaching Jesus with that. I don't have much more to say about this one. So we're moving on. Okay, the eighth station, Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem. So on the left, we have a print by John J.A. Murphy. He's an American artist. This is a woodblock print. It's black ink on white paper. And it's part of a series. And I think the, the Stations of the Cross is a popular uh, topic for artists because there's a whole series of, of the stations. So they can do all, the whole story. And uh, if you go to the Art Institute and look this up, you'll see all the other ones look just like this, that the top two thirds of the picture are scenery. It's nothing up there except just the land. And all the action is taking place down in this section down here. And I find it just fascinating that this artist could just use a few lines, just a few lines and a couple little spots and it just looks like a crowd of women kneeling ar around Jesus. It's clearly Jesus, the halo. And it's quite simple, uh, but it has a, a, a strong feeling of, of all these people kneeling. Um, one thing I was trying to do is find art that was not specifically of the stations, but that conveyed some feeling of the stations. And I came across this bronze sculpture on the right it's called Lamenting Group, and it's from about 1900 by Paul Albert Bartolome. Now, Bartolome was a very uh, prolific, celebrated sculptor in France. And uh, when I first encountered this piece while I was looking for things, I thought, this is great. It shows all these people. It looked like a lot of women, just really sad and, and hunched over and crying, and it's heavy looking and black and just it seemed as sad as the station feels. But then I found out that it's actually a study for a much larger sculpture that um, Bartolome made. And uh, when this pandemic is over and we take our women's group to Paris for a tour. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah, you know, think positive, Lisa. We can go to Père Lachaise Cemetery, which is, um, I wish I'd gone when I was in Paris. It sounds great. It, they have 
many, 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 many famous people buried at Père Lachaise Cemetery. Um, but they also have a big tomb for the unknown dead. And let's see if my detail will come up. There it is. This is that tomb. And you'll see over here on the left, this group of figures. And that is this same group of figures. So I think probably this was a study, something to try out the, the um, shapes of the people and then um, translated it to this larger piece. And um, you can go to Paris and see that. It says up here, oh, more. So this is um, for the unknown dead. The ninth station, Jesus falls the third time. Uh, this is Christ carrying the cross once again. And uh, this panel is another German panel from probably a larger altarpiece. And once again, we can look for our cast of characters. Uh, not a lot of scenery to look at. That first one was really lovely with, with uh, vistas and flowers. This one's pretty simple. But we can see there's Mary being taunted by people in funny hats. And they're almost always sticking their tongue out. I, I just think that's a funny little detail. Um, the taunters, the, the uh, soldiers. And I wanna call your attention to this one soldier here. Uh, the artist has depicted this soldier with his pants falling down. And I, I think the artist must have been taking the opportunity to poke fun at Jesus' tormentors in the only way he could by uh, pulling the guy's pants down. I just, <laughs> it's such a strange little detail, but uh, there it is. Something for, uh, you know, 600 years later, we, we get to notice. All right. The 10th station, Jesus is stripped of his garments. Now, technically, this picture is depicting something that happened before this. It's the part where they are putting the crown on Jesus and putting the robe on him to mock him as king of the Jews. Um, but it, it's too fabulous a painting and he is in fact stripped of his garments. So I'm using it here. This is by Edward Manet. Manet painted in the period between realism and impressionism. So uh, he's not quite into the Monet era where it's uh, more um, impressionistic and um, different brush strokes and everything. There's a little more realism, but he's, it's definitely different from when you go and look at the realist. It does have lighter brushwork. So um, you'll see Jesus here in the middle. He's painted very human, very uh, vulnerable. And the only uh, thing that kind of alludes to his godliness is that his gaze is going up toward heaven. Um, but otherwise it's just a very human depiction of Jesus. He's surrounded by these rough soldiers. And uh, I wanna call your attention to this guy here uh, on the right. He has stopped. He was putting that robe on Jesus and he noticed you. He's looking directly out at you. And it caused him to pause as he was putting the cloak on. And anytime an artist has a character in the painting looking out at you, it's breaking that fourth wall and it's pulling you into the painting. So when you see him staring at you, what do you imagine he's saying? Is he saying, hey, are you a friend of his? Or, uh, hey, could you give me a hand with this? Or, oh, I, I think I saw you hanging out with, the, with him last night. Was that you? Like, I think whatever you hear him saying to you is what you bring to the painting. Um, you know, it's, it's just, uh, I, I find a very direct connection to what Manet was, was um, painting with this. It's just stunning how he's just sort of like stopped and questioning you. Now this piece um, is a 
sculpture by an American artist, Jose Benito Ortega. And he had a really interesting story. So this is um, an item called a santo. And uh, Ortega was one of the uh, last of the santeros who were artists who traveled around New Mexico and Southern Colorado in the late 19th century, um, making religious sculptures called santos. Uh, this is about four and a half feet tall and it would have been uh, for a small chapel. Um, they used them in meeting houses, private homes, uh, religious communities. And this was largely uh, um, 1870s to early 1900s. Uh, he made them out of scrap mill board from, um, we'd like go to mills and the pieces they cut off, he would scoop up the little pieces of wood and, and make these sculptures. Um, so he did most of the work, his work around his home. And this was, he was doing this at a time when the clergy was attempting to replace Santos, these handmade pieces with mass produced plaster statues. And uh, Ortega kept at it, even though the church was starting to phase them out and bring in these more mass produced, cheaper sculptures. And uh, it said in the write up of him that he worked until his wife died and then he stopped. And uh, his, you can find uh, galleries in New Mexico who, that have these for sale. They're, they're um, just gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. The 11th station, Jesus is nailed to the cross. This is a piece by Albrecht Altdorfer, a German, that's a woodcut. And what I like about this is um, all the angles. You see all the swords and sticks, everything's pushing the action up, 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 up to the right hand, upper right hand corner. Everything's moving that direction. And I want you to contrast that with this piece by Mark Chagall. It's called The White Crucifixion. It's from 1938. A lot of Chagall's paintings don't seem to have um, gravity. They swirl and swirl about. Nothing is solid. It's just always swirling. So really different from that previous uh, picture where everything was angled and moving in one direction. This is just a constant swirl. So Chagall was French, born in Russia. And he painted this in 1938 when World War II was getting underway. And what he was trying to do was uh, call attention to the persecution of the Jews going on then by identifying that with the martyrdom of Jesus, who he's depicted here as a Jewish man. He's got this cloth that's um, a traditionally Jewish cloth, and he has it in the center. But on the side, you see the armies, the burning of the villages, you see the religious uh, people protecting the Torah and um, running away to get to safety. And he was trying to call attention to what was happening to European Jews in the 1930s. That is quite the piece. It, it's really stunning. And there's, I, I'm sure there's more detail. I, I don't know what all the little pieces are, but um, it, it's telling a story, but it's all swirling around the central piece of Jesus there. Okay, so uh, it's time to add another piece, not from Europe, uh, another Ethiopian artwork that the museum has. It's a uh, beautiful, triptych icon, triptych meaning it has three panels. So it's got this central panel. And then these are actually on the sides, they're doors that close over the middle panel. And uh, I don't actually know how big this is. Um, so Orthodox Christianity was uh, came to Ethiopia in about the fourth century. This was painted in the 17th century. Again, you've got the outlines, the bold colors, the uh, interesting designs. Uh, you've got Mary with the archangels on either side, uh, different saints depicted. And uh, it's, it's here under the um, crucifixion 
section because that's pictured right here. And this actually, this one in the middle is Jesus with the uh, crown of thorns. So again, using pictures to tell a story, you don't need words. If you know the stories, you can look and, and figure out who all these people are. And uh, I don't know if it's tabletop size or bigger. It, it's, uh, I've never seen it in person, but I just really like the, the bold design on there. <clears throat> okay, the 12th station, Jesus dies on the cross. So this is um, a fantastic painting by um, Z de Zubaran, Francisco de Zubaran. Um, he's Spanish. And this was originally painted for a monastery uh, in Seville. And it, apparently it hung in a dimly lit sacristy. Uh, it's got just a plain black background and Jesus on the cross with the light shining on him. It's really quite stunning to see it's uh, quite large. So it probably would have been behind the altar, kind of the way we have a crucifix behind our altar. Uh, we have a, a sculpture at our church, but this is uh, a painting that would have been probably in that position. Um, and uh, so he painted this during a time uh, of the counter reformation. So they were combating the influences of the Reformation. And the church started to recognize that you could use art to educate and inspire the people. And so they started requiring artists who were making things for the churches to work in a style that was clear and dramatic. And uh, Zubarin has definitely done that here. I think um, not having any kind of background pictures or other people, you're really able to focus on Jesus. Uh, it's outside of time and place, it just uh, eternal. And um, I just wanted to have us sit quietly with this picture for a minute and um, click and just have a little moment admiring this painting. Okay, we're on to the 13th station. Jesus is taken down from the cross. This is uh, an American artist, Abraham Ratner, called Descent from the Cross. And he worked in, uh, they call the expressive style. So more bolder um, paint uh, strokes, not too realistic, but you can definitely see what's going on. You can feel the weight of Jesus as they're trying to get him down. Um, again, wanna call your attention to this person back here, staring out directly at you. So what is he communicating to you right now? Is it um, asking for your help to help get Jesus down from the cross? Is he accusing you? Did you do this? Were you with those guys? Or is he connecting with your sorrow? Is he saying, yeah, I, I feel this too. Um, we're sad together. And again, it often is what you bring to the painting and probably different every time, depending on how you're feeling. Now, uh, you may have noticed that all of our artists have been men. And uh, part of the reason for that is that women in the Middle Ages and Renaissance didn't necessarily do this type of work. Uh, another reason is that maybe the Art Institute just doesn't have the works that women were doing. Um, I tried to find something um, specifically from the Stations of the Cross, but failed. But then I delved a little deeper and I came up with two, paint, uh, two works that I felt um, touched on the emotion of this station. Um, on the left, we have a photograph called Heritage of Motherhood from 1904 by Gertrude K. Spear. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her name right, but that's what we're going with. She was American. She grew up in the Plains States and photography was a pretty new art form at the turn of the century. And she was one of the first artists to 
be working in this new art form. And uh, she focused on portraits and the theme of mothers. And you see, she has a real kind of ethereal atmosphere. I just felt like this looked like Mary kneeling at the foot of the cross, praying for her son. Uh, this wilderness out here, just uh, kind of this kind of barren, hope, hopeless sort of place, but she's deep in prayer. Um, on the uh, right is a drawing, it might be a print, it might be a drawing, I forget, um, by Kate Kolwitz. She's a, uh, she was Prussian and uh, she drew this in 1919 and she had a son who died in World War I. And after that period, a lot of her art really focused on the subject of mourning and just this, uh, the sadness of this couple, the, the comforting of the man with his arms around, it just uh, felt like it just really went with this station to convey the, the feelings that Jesus's followers had that day, how just um, sad and um, broken everybody felt. The 14th station, Jesus is laid in the tomb. So for this one, I picked two pictures that um, are kind of different. Uh, over here is a drawing by Rembrandt. Uh, it's probably a, a print, Christ carried to the tomb. And Rembrandt went with what it probably looked like a cave in the hillside, group of people carrying uh, the body um, on some sort of platform. A um, little bit of scenery in the background. Over here, uh, the entombment uh, is an Italian panel, again, probably from a much larger piece. Uh, and down at the bottom, it says Stabat Mater Dolorosa, which is um, the Sorrowful Mother. So it could have been some panels telling Mary's stories. Um, so I, I sense that he painted a more Italian way of doing a burial. Back here, we've got a little Italian town. And uh, here is a very European looking tomb. And I think that uh, Maybe he hadn't heard like what what it looked like <laughs> in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, this is this would have been familiar to the people looking at this picture, this scene of an attunement. And I want to end. Uh, that's our last station, but I want to end on this painting by Georgia O'Keeffe. It's called Black Cross, and she painted it in 1929. Uh, she's an American painter. She largely did abstract paintings. And uh, this black cross is something that she saw in New Mexico where she uh, worked for uh, most of her life. So this is what she said about the cross. I saw the crosses so often and often in unexpected places like a dark veil of the Catholic church spread over the New Mexico landscape. And so apparently there were several of these and uh, the um, story was that they were probably erected near uh, remote chapels called Moradas. And uh, I, I just think it's so uh, fitting for this period of time after um, the crucifixion, but before Easter. So it's this dark cross, but in the distance, I, I choose to see this as a sunrise could be a sunset, but I, I'm choosing to see it as the sun rising. So we're in this period of mourning um, with the cross, but in the distance, the sun is coming up over the hills. And that is the end. Thank you very much for listening. Oh, oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was marvelous. That was awesome. You're the best docent ever. <laughs> that was wonderful. Yeah, yeah Julia, thank it. you. That was fantastic. Really appreciate glad it. I came. Oh, I'm so glad. Appreciate it. Uh, I like how you used such different media. You know, you had sculpture, you had pages of a book, you had altarpieces, you had 
um, different periods of art, different countries represented. And it was, we could send her an email. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. Um, yeah, thanks. I tried to get a variety of things and um, it was challenging to, to find things outside of Northern Europe, but uh, I made a little effort there to find a few uh, things from elsewhere. Does anyone have any questions about anything they saw? Or It was beautiful, Julia. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you, Nancy. I'm glad you could come. Sam set in on it also. <laughs> <laughs> he said to tell you he really enjoyed it. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> Thanks, Julia. Thank you very much. Thanks. That's my that's my aunt. I have a couple ants on here. Thank you, Auntie. <laughs> oh, shout out. Mm -hmm. My mom and dad over there in the Nancy G box. <laughs> Your aunt's down there with uh, Ed's computer. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, this was Hello, wonderful, Mary. Julia. There's Mary cranking. Hi, Mary. <laughs> hey, this is wonderful. Oh, good. Thank Enjoyed you. Enjoyed it. Yeah, well, 